So this session is Confronting Hard Histories, Teaching and Talking About Race and Racism in the Classroom. Um, Dr. Um, Hassan Jeffries is our um, instructor for today, um, our speaker. And a few things about him is that he currently um, is a associate professor at Ohio State University um, Department of History. Um, he is the faculty lead um, for, is it, um, is it, let me see. Oh, the difficult subjects. Difficult subjects. Thank mm -hmm. you. I can't read my writing. Difficult <laughs> subjects, K-12, um, Teacher Institute uh, on American Slavery. Um, and he's also a faculty fellow and so many other things that go along with it. Um, from the last session, I've heard wonderful comments. I heard the chat was fluttering with um, comments about they could stay on here and listen to you all day, um, but we won't be able to do that because you have other things to do. So we're really appreciative that you're here with us today and everybody, um, Dr. Hassan Jeffrey. So, hey, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that uh, in, in introduction. <laughs> Excuse me. The introduction, uh, but also the invitation uh, to share some thoughts and ideas and to be a part of this conversation uh, with the Westerville City Schools community. Um, and the chat is open. Uh, by all means, if you have um, thoughts and ideas, uh, feel free to uh, drop a drop a drop a note in the chat. Um, I'm I'm teaching uh, two classes this year at Ohio State and all virtually, uh, and I wasn't anticipating. Uh, the chat to become such an integral part uh, of the online experience, but my kids have a whole side, they have whole sidebar conversations going on, you know, sort of in the chat. So uh, by all means, it has, it, it's totally fine and they ask questions in there. So uh, by all means, use the chat function and some thoughts and ideas of things you want to share or even resources. Um, I, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm pro chat. Uh, and after, after I, you know, after my classes, I have to go back and uh, I get a strong adult beverage uh, and I ain't talking about coffee uh, and I'll read the chat and I'll just die crack up laughing. Right. I mean, these kids, I'm amazed sometimes uh, that, um, you know, every time I, you know, I got 120 in one class uh, and I, when I every Tuesday or Thursday, when I click on, I, I'm like, y'all still here. Y'all still showing up and they're there. They're trying to learn. Um, so so by all means, uh, use that. Um, we will have I'm going to share my screen in a second and I have a formal presentation, but um, as questions, if you know, if you have questions, um, you know, as I'm going through, just just you know, put a note in. Oh, it's a little quiet. Um, just put a little note in. I'll speak a little louder. If, if anybody else had an audio difficulty, let me know. Um, just put a little note in the uh, the chat, uh, and I will be sure to uh, sort of recognize you, uh, and then we can so we can have a little bit of a dialogue all the way through. We don't have to wait till the very end uh, to have to have questions and and, and discussion. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen now. So as Cynthia pointed out, um, the, I, I've titled my remarks for uh, this morning, Confronting Hard History, Teaching and Talking About Race and Racism in the Classroom. And, and before, we, before we dive into, at any moment, um, teaching and talking about race and racism in the classroom, it's important for us to recognize and acknowledge uh, the moment in which we are living. So what is the, what is the contemporary context uh, that we will be talking about um, and teaching about race and racism? Because that context changes uh, all the time. Uh, and it is, it is critically important uh, that we understand what it is because that informs the kinds of questions uh, that our students uh, are, will be asking, the kind of questions uh, that they are seeking answers for and also what sort of knowledge base they are bringing to the table and what they want to get out of the class uh, or our class. So the moment is critically important. And the moment that we are living in, and of course today, 2020, November 3rd, uh, we have a national presidential election of some major consequence, uh, but even more so than that, what is so unique, I mean, those happen every four years, right? But what's even more unique than that uh, is the protests uh, that have, or all the protests that have occurred uh, this past summer, uh, protests under the banner of Black Lives Matter. Uh, these are not just um, sort of, you know, something that we see every summer, ah, protests are protests. What we saw this summer, starting with the, um, following the murder of the death of George Floyd, 46-year-old African-American, Minneapolis, Minnesota, at the hands of Minneapolis police, 
what we have seen are the largest protests in American history. And this isn't hyperbole. Like this is literally, we have seen the large, we are living through a moment in which we have witnessed the largest protests in American history, where by some estimates we're talking about in June and July, some 35 million Americans took to the streets, 35 million in consecutive days, took to the streets um, seeking justice for the victims of police violence. Now to put this in perspective, during the civil rights movement, the largest single day demonstration, the largest demonstration was the March on Washington. And that had just under a quarter million people, a quarter million people one day, not tens of millions over consecutive days spread across the country. Uh, the largest uh, single day demonstration again in American history up until this summer was the Women's March uh, in January of 2017. And that had about 3 million people scattered across the country. So we're talking about 35 million people over consecutive days. This is a historic moment. And what are these, and what are folk, many of whom are our students, uh, or what have they been seeking? What have they been asking for? What have they been demanding? They've been demanding justice. Again, justice for the victims of racial uh, violence, racial terror. But they've also been seeking recognition. And this is critically important because, you know, and as teachers, we'll, and, and I'm sure Westerville is no different, uh, you'll have pushback from parents and you may have pushback from your school districts. Uh, around the uh, acknowledging or recognizing or even saying uh, that black lives matter. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, black lives matter as a slogan, as a statement, is, is a simple statement seeking recognition of black humanity. Uh, and the humanity of any group of people uh, should never be politicized. Uh, it, 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 if not, humanity isn't partisan. Uh, this is who we are uh, and who we should be. Uh, and so we saw in this effort to seek recognition, this demand that Black Lives Matter, seek recognition of Black humanity, the spread of these beautiful murals right, across the country. And this is a mural right down the road from us uh, in Cincinnati, uh, Black Lives Matter. And we saw them dotting the landscape uh, across the country from coast to coast, Black folks seeking, young people seeking, allies seeking uh, a recognition of Black humanity that for too long has been denied. But there's a third component a third purpose to these protests uh, that we saw manifest in the efforts uh, of protesters, of activists, to uh, remove uh, monuments to white supremacy. Uh, monuments such as the uh, various Confederate monuments. This is the Robert E. Lee uh, Monument in Richmond, Virginia, um, on Monument Boulevard for anybody who's traveled down to uh, Richmond or, or through Richmond in the past. Uh, and we see uh, the ways in which activists reimagined uh, these monuments, projecting onto uh, this monument, BLM, Black Lives Matter, onto uh, uh, Robert E. Lee's uh, mighty steed there, if you will, uh, and onto the base, uh, No America Without uh, Black America. What is this about? Uh, why are, what does that have to do with racial justice? Uh, what does that have to do with recognizing uh, Black humanity? Well, it is seeking an honest account of the past. I mean, one of the things, and this is especially important for us as educators and meaningful for us as educators, is that young people in particular, and the vast majority of those millions who took to the streets were under the age of 35, many of whom were our students in college and in high school and elementary school uh, and even younger. They have been demanding that we tell the truth, uh, that we tell the truth about the past, that we move away from these false narratives, such as the lost cause. Now, they have been focusing specifically uh, and most immediately on uh, Confederate monuments and Confederate statues uh, because they are well aware uh, that these uh, are representations of white supremacy, uh, that slavery itself uh, or the, the Confederacy itself was founded for the principal purpose of maintaining the institution of slavery, which is predicated on white supremacy. And that these monuments are monuments that are erected 50 years, the first wave is 50 years after uh, the Civil War ends. And the second wave is the 19 teens during the height of Jim Crow uh, and violent white supremacy that's occurring not just in the South, but in uh, Midwest cities as well. It's riots in Springfield and Cincinnati and uh, in Illinois and the like. And a second wave uh, of, of this sort of propaganda monuments, if you will, uh, we see in the 1950s in response to the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, that's when states like Georgia add the stars and bars uh, to their state flag. Uh, that's when we begin to see the renaming of streets and schools after 
uh, Confederate icons. Uh, and then in 1970, uh, for those who I went to undergraduate school down in Atlanta, Georgia in 1970, uh, 1970s is when Stone Mountain, uh, the largest Confederate monument uh, in, in America was completed, 1970s. Uh, with funding from the state legislature. That is a hundred years. That's a century after the end of the Civil War. That's like somebody saying, hey, let's build a couple monuments uh, to, to the Nazis, not this year, but in 30 years from now. Like how insane would we be like, that might not be a good idea, right? But how is this possible? Why is this, why do we allow uh, this sort of propaganda to persist? Uh, because we have been sharing for too long uh, a version of the past that just simply isn't true, right? This sort of lost cause narrative uh, that does no one uh, any service uh, when it comes to uh, actually explaining what occurred in the past and explaining uh, what we are seeing uh, in terms of inequality, in terms of disparities, in the terms of the legacies of the institution today. And so this is this third purpose is especially important for us as educators because it creates for us an opportunity. It creates for us as educators, our students, our young people have created an opportunity for us to talk and teach about race in ways that we have never had uh, before. Uh, certainly in, not, in my 18 years uh, teaching at Ohio State uh, and for many of us even longer, even longer than that. This is an opportunity. Our students are demanding that we teach um, race and racism honestly and they deserve that we teach and talk about race and racism, honestly. And so this is where uh, I want to sort of begin our, our conversation uh, as a response to the moment uh, in which we, uh, we find ourselves today, a moment uh, that is an opportunity created by uh, the courage of students and young people uh, to, to take to the streets. Now, if we are to talk about and, and teach this history um, and the present, uh, and race and racism ac accurately and effectively. Uh, so what are some of the, the basic notions, basic starting points that we need to have? Uh, well, the first one is uh, we, we have to teach truth. Uh, we are um, educators, we are not physicians, uh, but physicians take the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, and one of the core components in the Hippocratic Oath is do no harm. Uh, and, and as educators, we have to do the same thing. We, we ought not uh, we have to be guided by uh, the idea of doing no harm, right? We have to educate. We can't do harm. And when we don't teach the truth, uh, either by omission or commission, purposefully leaving it out, or we simply don't know it and don't know what to do with it, uh, then we are actually doing harm. Uh, because the truth is what our students want. And the truth is what uh, our students need, no matter how hard or difficult it is to hear. Uh, and that's what we need to do. So our starting point, uh, is teaching truth. We also have to teach hard, what I call hard history. Hard history are those aspects of our past. And now our past is our remote and our recent past uh, that are difficult for us to talk about uh, because they make us uncomfortable. Not, not uncomfortable about the past, but uncomfortable in the present. Uh, race in particular and racism as well, collected, taken together, are really the third rail of polite conversation in American society. It's what we're not supposed to talk about, right? I mean, even when you when you sort of mention somebody's race, right? Just listen to the way in people, you know, I, I like to mess with folk, I can't help it, right? That might be the New Yorker in me. And so when you're having a conversation with somebody and it's like, yes, you're like they're talking and go ahead and say, yes, and the person was African-American, right? or the person was white and they whisper it. And I'm like, what do you mean, white? Are you saying white? The, and they're like, oh, no, no, no. I mean, but even in the way we don't even want to bring ourselves to mention uh, a race, even when we're not having a, 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 a conversation of any significant difficulty, right? Like why? Uh, because we're, we, we've become so uncomfortable with talking about something that is so central to our existence. So we got to teach hard history, teach those subjects in the past, slavery, Jim Crow, civil rights, lynching, peonage, um, racial inequality, discrimination, right? That make us uncomfortable, but that are essential to understanding uh, sort of the arc of American American history. We have, I'm gonna say more about this in particular later on. We have to teach resistance when teaching and talking about race and, and, and racism, we have to teach resistance. The ways in which African-Americans have fought back and challenged uh, their oppression and their marginalization. This is absolutely critical because this is the entry point 
to to the humanity of black folk. Right. And, and I'll say more about that later on, because we have an empathy gap when it comes to being able to connect with people of color, when it comes to being able to connect with people of color in the present or in the past. But if we teach resistance, that becomes the entryway to be able to get our students to empathize with people uh, who do not look like them. And then last, that we cannot be afraid to teach today. We have to teach today. I'm teaching a class for the first time this semester um, called The Last 50, uh, that looks at the last 50 years of the African-American experience yeah, the officer for those who have been, you know, who are graduates of Ohio State, we have the Office of Diversity of Inclusion, used to be the Office of Minority Affairs, and is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And so they have reached out to me and said, well, Dr. Jeffries, we would love it if you could teach a class uh, that looks at uh, sort of the um, African-American experience here at Ohio State. And that was the plan before sort of the coronavirus hit. And then uh, we had the protest this summer. So we kept the book on the class, but we changed the focus a little bit to look at the last 50 years of the African-American experience through the prism and perspective of, of young people, both at Ohio State and beyond. But teaching today, one of the things I did in that class, and it has been remarkably successful, I think so far, the kids are still showing up, is that I taught, I'm teaching the class backwards. And so I literally started, we started in August and I started with the uh, Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention. And then we walked back and looked at the summer of protests. Uh, and then we sort of, we, we literally have been walking back through time and now we're in the 1980s. We got about another decade and a half. And so teaching today, why? Because today is what people, the kids are most familiar with. And today is also what they're trying to make sense of. So whether we teach the course going backwards or we teach the course going forward, or, or it's just, we're just talking about sort of things that are happening today that's what kids want to understand. If we get them hooked on trying to make sense of the present, uh, then they would be better positioned and more willing and more open uh, to talking about those difficult subjects of the past that we tend to avoid. So if these are sort of, sort of starting ideas, starting points, where in fact should we begin? Uh, well, we must begin uh, by talking about race itself. And this is so important uh, in this critical point. Uh, that race as a, as a, as a construct uh, is not real. Like this is something that many of us would have heard in you know, race in, in, in graduate school or in college. You know, race is a social construct. What does that mean? That means the joint ain't real. It's not real. It's a fiction. Uh, race is biologically meaningless. And this, you, you know, I, I am still amazed uh, when I talk to students, to young people, no matter what age, even, even my kids who come to college, and I say simply, race isn't real. And they're like, what? Like, what do you mean it's not real? I'm like, it's biologically meaningless. And they're like, really? Now these aren't folk who are, you know, died in a war, white supremacists, no one ever told them that race isn't real, right? That race was literally a fabrication, that there is, there's nothing, uh, there's no biological difference of any significance uh, in our genetic code. Uh, for anybody who's on this Zoom call, anybody who's in our classes, anybody around the world. Biologically, race is meaningless. Uh, we could just toss it aside and it wouldn't uh, make a difference in anybody's life. It has no explanatory force biologically, but it is socially meaningful. And this is where it gets complicated, right? Because it's biologically meaningless and yet it is socially meaningful because for the last 500 years of global history, it has shaped uh, and created our high, our social hierarchies, right? Like, so, so we cannot look at the past and we cannot dismiss race, right? And just say, well, it's biologically meaningless so therefore we don't have to deal with it. No, because it has social meaning because we look to race and certainly in American society, we look to race as an explanatory force and we have used race to structure and create hierarchy, right? Literally from, for the last 400 uh, plus years. Uh, and so biologically meaningless, but socially meaningful, our students need to get that. And then third, it's culturally relevant. So in the American context, especially, excuse me, in American context, especially, we use race as a stand-in for cultural heritage. We use race as a stand-in for cultural ancestry, right? So, so we can't dismiss it, right? Because it's biologically meaningless. Uh, because it has this real social meaning, right? It's structured in our life and because we use it as a substitute for who we are, for the cultural ancestry. That's why we have to avoid the colorblind trap. We cannot 
not talk about race. Right? I, I apologize to all of our uh, English teachers there for the double negative, but it is, we can't not talk about it, right? We have to talk, we can't dismiss it. We can't fall into the colorblind trap. Why? Uh, because that actually denies uh, people their lived experience, right? The problem uh, with, the problem isn't talking about race. The problem isn't identifying people by race. The problem is discriminating against people because of race. The problem is projecting uh, certain thoughts and ideas, stereotypes uh, onto people because of this thing called race. That's the problem. Then not too long ago, well, it actually is getting kind of long. <laughs> Last time I was on the airplane, uh, flying back from, from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, after giving a number of uh, lectures down there at the National Civil Rights Museum, um, I was sitting on sitting the plane, minding my business, and you know, I was appreciating a quiet moment because I was about to come home uh, to three young girls. I got three daughters, 10, 10, eight, and five. And so I appreciated my little time in the airplane and, and while I was traveling because I, it would be quiet. Uh, and I'm sitting there and I'm hoping you know how you are, you're, like, you're sitting there, you're hoping nobody sits next to you, right? Like, oh, I'm not gonna stretch out, but I wasn't so fortunate. Uh, and a nice white lady comes and she's like, oh, is this my seat? I'm like, yeah, you know, so she sits down and I'm hoping we, you know, I, you know I, I'm from New York, but I spent a lot of time in the South, right? So I, I got good manners. And so, you know, when she talks, you know, I, I, I respond and I talk back, but I was hoping she wouldn't say anything. And then, and then, and then I, you know, she asked, she said, well, she said, well, what do you do, right? I was, you know, dressed after just giving a presentation. So what do you do? And then I, at that moment, and that's usually when I say, you know, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a plumber, right? Like I'm a, cause nobody's like a plumber. There ain't nobody gonna ask you any more questions after that. Uh, but as soon as I tell them, like, well, I teach African-American history, I teach U.S. history. It's like, oh, oh, right. The two things either, either happen as a response to that. One, they want to tell me how much history they know, right? Which I'm not really interested in. Uh, or two, they want to tell me, about how colorblind they are, right? And that's exactly where she went, right? The next thing she does, she's like, oh, you know, you, the, you know, you know, I don't see race, right? I believe that nobody should, she goes on this whole soliloquy about how she doesn't see race and how it's important not to see race and this, that, and the other, right? And I'm just, I'm just counting, them, I'm counting the seconds until she tells me about her one black friend, right? Who she's had all her life who don't see race either. And then sure enough, bam, there it is, right? She's talking about her one black friend and how close they are. And what she actually does, very nice, very nice, very nice white lady, right? You know, we, we, we shared our we shared our our our, our, our airport cookies together, uh, but what she did, and I had to explain. So I was like, you know what you did? You just erased me. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, when you say that you're colorblind, that you don't see race, of course you see race. Right? Psychologists tell us that children, that infants as young as two and three months old, are able to distinguish people by race based upon the signals and cues that they're picking up from their caregivers. Like we all see race. The two things that we all see uh, immediately that register in our subconscious, as soon as we see somebody, uh, is their race, what we could see, what we perceive to be their race, uh, and their gender. Now watch people, watch the confusion on people. And I, one thing I love to do, I love to people watch. That's why this, this, this pandemic is messing with me, right? Because I used to love just to sit down and watch people, right? You watch people who can't identify somebody's race, right? And I see it in the classroom all the time, right? You can't, they can't identify their gender. They, they're just, they're, their face is like, what? Like who, like who is this person? What is this person? I don't understand, why? Because we use those as indicators, right? For pu putting people in various boxes, right? And so we all see race. We just gotta acknowledge that we all see race. But when you pretend that you're colorblind, what you're actually doing, when I said you're erasing me, is you're denying my lived experience. You're, you're denying the experience of like myself growing up uh, in segregated Brooklyn, New York, right? Uh, you're denying the experience of my parents growing up in the segregated South uh, for, you know, for various parts and living through the Jim Crow era. Uh, you're denying the, the experience of my great grandparents uh, who were enslaved in Georgia uh, and in Virginia. And that's not, a, that's not something I want erased, right? That's not a source of shame. Uh, the fact that they were able to endure slavery, able to endure Jim Crow, and able to provide for my brother and I uh, so that we could have professional careers is not a source of shame, it's a source of pride, right? So we do not want to erase people by pretending uh, that we don't see race, that by pretending uh, that we are colorblind. And at the same time, uh, we have to acknowledge our own racial identities, whether you're black or white or other, in American society as well. And I'll say more about uh, the importance of, of that. But again, the problem isn't seeing race. The problem isn't acknowledging race. The problem isn't talking about race. It's only a problem because, especially because of that cultural ancestry and heritage, 
Uh, the problem is discriminating against people on the basis of race, and that's not what we want to do. As a starting point, we absolutely want to talk about race uh, and explain to our students that race is not real, but we also want to, or not, uh, that race is not real, but we also want to explain to our students but that, that racism is real. And this is so vitally important, right? Because you literally have people uh, host that, that say, well, racism no longer exists. Or that race isn't real. That may have been something that happened a long time ago, but you know, it's not something that persists into the present. Well, that ain't true, right? Uh, we know that racism manifests itself uh, in two broad categories. It is <clears throat> it manifests itself in personal ways, prejudicial beliefs and behaviors, right? And, and this is, can, can, can take the form of explicit bias, right? Preju prejudice that is blatant and intentional. Uh, you see this in people using uh, derogatory language and the like, right? It's the explicit, right? People are purposefully, intentionally trying to do harm, purposefully and intentionally discriminating uh, against people solely because of the color, literally the color of their skin. But we also have uh, implicit manifestations, right? Implicit bias, uh, racism manifesting itself uh, in implicit ways, because prejudice is uh, embedded in our subconscious, right? And, and, and we, we have to acknowledge that. If we live, and that's just not, this is, some people say, well, are you saying that all, are you saying that all white people are racist, right? I'm saying all people in America harbor racial prejudice because this is America. And this is what it means to grow up in this society. Now, it, mani it can manifest itself in intentional or unintentional ways, explicit or implicit ways, but there is no way around it. And that does not, that includes myself, right? I mean, the, the only difference between uh, me and the average white person uh, when it comes to understanding the ways in which prejudice has influenced and continue to influence and impact their lives in terms of how they see the world is I'm much more cognizant of it because I'm doing much more self-reflection. I know what I'm, I know what I'm, the stereotypes I'm supposed to harbor and hold uh, when I see a group of African-American youth, right? Because those same thoughts filter into my head because I'm a part of the same society. I'm constantly receiving those same signals. And the sooner that we acknowledge that, the sooner we'll be able to get it out of our heads uh, and move beyond. It's just a function of the society in which we live. And the sooner we're able to acknowledge, the sooner we can move forward. So we have the personal, but then we also have the structural. Right? Now we do a better job of talking about the personal the individual beliefs and behaviors, whether they are explicit or implicit. We, do, we don't do a good enough job talking about the structural. It becomes a little bit more complicated, but it's something that our students absolutely need to be aware of, that there are the personal manifestations, but you also have the structural. And the structural is so critically important because if, it's, if we only talk about racism in the context of the personal, well, then the solutions to uh, the problems brought about by racism and racial discrimination are actually very simple. And they're not, right? Like if we only think, for example, that, that racism, the only source of racism is personal, then when we look back at the civil rights movement in the civil rights era, then at, in, in, in a case like Birmingham, Alabama, uh, where you have a bull Connor uh, who, who was ordering the police uh, to turn water hoses on and sicking dogs on uh, nonviolent demonstrators and protesters, if we only see racism as personal, well, then the solution to that problem, that manifestation of racism in Birmingham in 1963 is very simple. Just get rid of Bull Connor, right? He's the source and the problem. But we know in 1963, uh, when Bull Connor is voted out of office, right, the problems of police violence, the problems of uh, racial terrorism, the problems of bombings, uh, 16th Street Baptist Church, the problems of Job discrimination continued uh, because it's not simply a function. Uh, racial discrimination and inequality isn't simply a function of personal behavior. It's the ways in which it is a function of the ways in which uh, we have structured our society to privilege some and to disadvantage others based upon this thing that we call race. So if, if that is both the moment and the starting point, right? for what our, what, our, what our young people, what our kiddos, if you will, uh, need to sort of have in the back of their mind, then this will help them as we walk through history. And this is, you know, walk through American history, walk through this thing called uh, hard history. Uh, and where should we begin? And where should we be thinking about uh, beginning uh, when we're gonna touch upon any of these subjects? 
uh, I think that we have to begin in the beginning. We have to talk about slavery, not just as America's original sin, but slavery as America's origin. Right in 1619 in uh, Fort Comfort in uh, off uh, 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 close to Jamestown, Virginia, uh, some 20 and odd uh, enslaved uh, Africans uh, from the coast, uh, from the region of Angola are brought to the Virginia colony. Uh, these would be the first Africans who would be sold into slavery in Virginia. Uh, but we see as Virginia, uh, as the American colonies will grow uh, that that slavery is the engine. It's the economic engine um, that allows for the colonies uh, to boom, to thrive. I mean, for the first three quarters of the 1600s, the 17th century, uh, you know, the American colonies are, are, are a backwater, an afterthought, because uh, they couldn't grow sugar, right? I mean, it was all about, for the British colonies, it was all about um, uh, sugar cane. Uh, and so slavery is an afterthought. But uh, by the time we get to the 1670s, for a number of reasons, we see that slavery exists in every one of the 13 colonies and is permitted in every one of the 13 colonies. It is an American institution, right, where the labor is concentrated primarily in the southern colonies, but even the northern colonies like Massachusetts and Connecticut, they're pioneering in slave law, right, how to manage uh, and keep people in bondage. So when we think about, I like to think about sort of, you know, America's DNA, and there's really two core components to America's DNA when we think about slavery as America's origin. Uh, and that is racism that provides specifically white supremacy that will provide the justification for the institution of slavery and capitalism, right? That provides the, is the economic mode uh, for which that, that serves as the driver uh, for, the, for the American experiment, the American journey. The two of those are the, are, are, the, are the strands of the double helix of America's DNA because they work together and they work in, a, in, in an operation. Uh, and in the colonial era and the early American revolution and new, the new national era, that manifests itself in uh, an economic system of slavery. Uh, and afterward, after slavery is finally abolished, uh, it will continue in the form of Jim Crow, right? Which isn't just a social system, but it's an economic system that isn't just impacting the South, it's also impacting uh, or shaping uh, the colonies of or the nations of the North. And this isn't something that just is limited to the, the, um, the early period, the colonial era. Uh, this is very much something, this, this, the intersection of, of, of racism, the infusion of racism into the very founding and founding documents of this nation uh, are something that we have to uh, acknowledge and be aware of. Right? especially as we move into, I mean, think about the moment that we are in, uh, in 2020, uh, today, election day. Uh, one of the things that uh, our students ought to be thinking about, even young learners, uh, is the electoral college, right? And, and part of the reasons why the electoral college exists uh, is because of these questions of how do we count, how do we enumerate um, enslaved folk? Uh, within uh, these populations in the southern states. I mean, so we're literally still living uh, with the legacies uh, of, uh, of a society that was a, a slave society uh, that maintained the institution of slavery that was so central uh, to, the, uh, to the development, the birth and the origin of it. I've, ha I've had the great pleasure, and, and I truly miss it this semester, um, for the last uh, two years or so of taking a small group of students down to James Madison's uh, plantation estate, uh, Montpelier, which is in Virginia, not too far from Charlottesville. And James Madison, of course, is fourth president of the United States, uh, the father of the constitution, the architect uh, of the Bill of Rights. And, and so I very much enjoy taking students down there. And this is an image of Madison's library, the second floor study in which literally the room in which he conceived and conceptualized the Bill of Rights. Um, but Madison was also uh, an enslaver. Uh, Madison enslaved uh, over 100 people over the course of his lifetime, uh, and he never freed a single soul, uh, not even upon his death. And slavery was, was a core part of Madison's identity, of who he was, right? Like we often look back and, and think about um, sort of slavery or talk about slavery, uh, like for somebody like Madison or Jefferson or Washington, Washington, both of those two, uh, both uh, enslaved more people, claimed ownership over more people than uh, James Madison. Uh, but Madison was a third generation enslaver, third generation. 
His grandfather was the one that carved this land out, Ambrose Madison. So, so, so slavery is in, is, is in his blood. Like it is the family business, right? Like slavery, owning people, buying and selling people <clears throat> was not some side hustle for Madison. Like this was the way of life and it influences and informs all that he does, right? So after I have my students um, spend a little time in the uh, Madison's library, Madison study, I say, well, look, we, now we got to go downstairs to the, to the basement. We got to go downstairs to the cellars uh, where the majority of enslaved people spent most of their time, right? Making it possible for Madison uh, to have the free time that he could think about um, you sort of, uh, you know, a, a new government, creating a new government. And I have them, I bring them downstairs to the cellars and I have them place their hands on the walls of the cellars. Uh, and if you look very closely uh, on the second image of the bricks, uh, in that middle of that, cent that center brick, you'll see some uh, indentations, some impressions in the brick. And what those are, are actually handprints uh, because all of the bricks on Madison's plantation, uh, just as all of the bricks uh, on Monticello, on Monticello and Mount Vernon, Jefferson and Washington were made by hand, were made by the enslaved people uh, who lived there. But when you put your, so when you touch those bricks, you're actually feeling, not just touching, History, you're feeling history, right? I mean, these were the hands of people who, who made it. But when you put your hands on those bricks, you realize that how, the question that comes to mind is, well, how are these handprints? They're too small. Like these can't literally be handprints. They're too small. And that's when it dawns on you that they're, they're handprints, all right, but they're the handprints of children because it was the children who Madison enslaved that made the bricks uh, for the entire plantation for the entire slave labor camp. That was their job at five years old, at six years old. That was their job at Mount Vernon. That was their job at Monticello. Uh, and so think about the contrast uh, between what the founders are saying, what Madison is saying in terms of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and also what he meant because he meant to deny those basic rights to African-Americans, to the enslaved children uh, who had created the bricks that serves the foundation, not just for this library, but literally for the nation as a whole. So when talking about the past, it is critically important that we, ex that we stop pretending to be the nation that our founders never meant us to be. They never meant. Thomas Jefferson, when he's writing, all men are created equal, right? Like he did not feel the need to qualify and say all oh, white men are created equal. Right. Because he had already cast out African-Americans from the human family. Right. Like the, the, he wasn't he wasn't like, you know, assuming that, well, one day women will be equal. Right. Like, no, there was never an intention for that. And so it's critically important that we acknowledge that uh, because that allows us to grow in directions uh, that far exceed uh, the wildest visions and the limited vision of the founders themselves. You know, it's, it's not just a, you know, it, it's so critically important that when we are talking and, and thinking about uh, race and racism in American society, that when it comes to uh, Ohio, right, that we don't stop the conversation there. Uh, one of the things that uh, I get a kick out of uh, when my students, uh, when your students from Westerville and these uh, surrounding cities uh, and, and suburbs come to Ohio State, uh, they have a lot of Ohio pride and that's fine. I'm totally down with that. You know, my three girls were born here in Ohio and they're Buckeyes through and through and they have a lot of Ohio pride. But when we start talking about history, uh, we start talking about the founding of Ohio, right? That pride is like, hey, Dr. Jeffries, uh, here in Ohio, we were on the right side of history uh, because we did not, uh, in Ohio, the royal we, we did not permit slavery uh, to occur here in Ohio. Right. We come in as a free state. So, Dr. Jeffries, we're on the right side of history. And I'm like, yeah, Ohio was on the right side of history, but for the wrong reasons. The reason why Ohio comes in as a free state is because the white uh, white men who settled Ohio did not want uh, and removed Native Americans from Ohio did not want African-Americans here. Right. They shared the same basic beliefs in white supremacy that Virginians and West Virginians believed in. West Virginians later on, Virginians at the time and Kentuckians, because that's who settled the state. 
They just didn't want to have to deal with the institution of slavery. And so what we see are laws and measures embedded in the Constitution of Ohio uh, that make it difficult for African-Americans to come in. And they say, if you do come in, you have to post a bond and they have all these uh, additional uh, laws and measures uh, that black folk have to deal with. And so it's critically important that we have that our students understand like what it means to be on the right side of history uh, when you're on the right side for the wrong reasons. Because if our students don't, especially here in Ohio, if our students don't get uh, that white supremacy uh, was a national phenomenon, something shared across the nation uh, and not just a Southern phenomenon, uh, then they are ill prepared uh, to explain and understand um, the ways in which racial inequality uh, has persisted and the ways in which it exists uh, in society today. Right? Because if you don't understand that this is something that's deeply rooted uh, as deeply embedded in our society as the founding of the as the founding of the state itself, then when you see inequality, then you default back to, well, I guess black folk, I guess people of color uh, just not just just must not be living up to their potential. Right. That is not something that has that could possibly uh, be limiting uh, their opportunities, uh, because, of course, Ohio was on the right side of history. Racism was something that happened down there and not up here. I mentioned earlier that it's so critically important that we teach uh, resistance um, and, and we have to. Uh, we here in o Ohio have the great benefit uh, of, uh, of, of being a center and site of the Underground Railroad. And that's wonderful. And the why you have to teach resistance is because that is the resistance is one of the best ways to get students to connect to marginalized people, to connect to uh, people who were enslaved, to connect to uh, people who were victims uh, of racial violence and racial terror and convict leasing and the like. Like that is so critically important because one of the things that when you present young people, when you present students with difficult situations in slavery by far is a difficult situation. The first, the natural inclination is, well, if that was me, this is what I would have done. And when, you, when we don't teach resistance, that immediately adds to this disconnect. Well, why did they not fight back, right? Why did they not challenge their oppression, right? And, and, and that's so critically important because we already are engaged in this act of sort of objectifying them, the enslaved, right? Uh, we, talk, we talk about them in terms of slaves and not in terms of enslaved people, right? I mean, just even that language shift is so critically important, right? Slavery is a status, right? If you are a slave, that is a legal status. If you are an enslaved person, uh, you're, you're recognizing, acknowledging that humanity. So resistance is this entry point. It allows young people, no matter how old they are, to see a little bit of themselves in people who they would otherwise not connect with. <clears throat> so when you we, we talk about uh, somebody like Ona Judge, 17-year-old, uh, uh, African-American uh, girl, 16, 17 year old African-American girl who runs away uh, from the plantation estate of George Washington, right? And, and, and George Washington would never, he, George Washington places ads in it. George Washington will place, first president of the United States is placing ads for her repeatedly over the, you know, until he dies trying to get this young African-American woman back and she will live free um, having escaped up until the 1830s, 1840s, and she will write about this. And when asked, well, what is, why did you run away from George Washington, right? Like, my God, like, that would be an honor to live in this household. And she was like, I wanted to be free. Like, it ain't complicated, right? I don't care who he was, right? He was keeping me from being free. Uh, and so that's what, I, that's what I wanted. Now, let me go right back and I'll come back to the slide, but we gotta be careful, right? There's always a balance. And so here in, <coughs> here in Ohio, you know, my experience has been that our students suffer from uh, what I call underground railroad itis. Uh, that you know, when when I talk about the underground railroad, it's like the one thing that they remember. Like, what do you know about African American history? Ah, underground railroad, right? And I ask my students, especially my white students, they say, everybody here, you know, if you would have been a conductor on the underground railroad, raise your hand, right? I had a class of hundred students, and like every hand goes up, every one of these white hands go up, and I'm like that's wonderful. I'm very happy for you. But that ain't true, right? Like if, if, if everyone would have supported the Underground Railroad, the darn thing wouldn't have been underground, 
right? Everybody couldn't have been abolitionists. So what does it mean? What does it mean then that we would not all have been abolitionists? What does it mean that we all would not have been on the right side of history, right? That's not a critique of who you are in the moment, but we can't project who we want to be back on the past, right? Because that does a disservice that, that prevents us from understanding how deeply embedded uh, this belief in white supremacy and racial inequality uh, is in American society. If we say, oh, this is what I would have done in the past. So we have to fight against that urge, right? And, and, and make sure that our students uh, are aware uh, of uh, sort of dynamics of the time. And this is especially important. I was talking about owner judge and this is one of the advertisements uh, that, that uh, Jeff, uh, 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 Washington uh, places trying to trying to get her back. And there's a wonderful book called Never Caught. Uh, and it's actually a children's adaptation. We think about young learners in fourth grade or so uh, for them on own a judge. Um, but we have an we have an empathy deficit deficit. And this is this is also one of the challenges of teaching uh, and talking about uh, race and racism in American society. Um, I had a conversation with a teacher um, before a couple years ago uh, and fourth grade teacher. And she came up to me after a presentation and talk. And she was trying to convince me that young people and her fourth graders in general, this generation that was coming up, uh, lacked empathy. They just didn't have it. Uh, and she was saying that she was trying that she was doing a lesson on immigration and the issues that were happening on the border and kids in cages. And you all remember these images of family separation and stuff that was happening on the southern border. And she said she was showing these uh, images to uh, her students, her fourth graders, and she puts them up. And she said, they, they just looked at it, right? I mean, had no reaction, uh, none whatsoever to seeing little, you know, little brown children, if you will, um, sort of, you know, with these uh, little blankets and sleeping on the floor and like no reaction. And she, she was like, they just, she's like, they, they just devoid of empathy. I don't know what we have done as a society to devoid of empathy. And I said, no, I said, no, no, no. Our, our, our children are not devoid of empathy. They have empathy. They just don't have empathy uh, for black and brown children and black and brown people who are suffering. Uh, and, and she, you know, we went back and forth and I said, finally, I was like, look, 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 look lady, um, this is what I need. This is what I want you to do. Uh, when you go back to your classroom, I said, uh, pull up for your class, for your students, uh, one of those, um, ASPCA commercials, you know, at, at two o'clock, two 30 in the morning when you can't sleep. Right. And, and it's Sarah McLaughlin singing some sad song in the back. Right. And you got a little puppy like with one leg and no eyes, right? Like chained up, laying on the ground and you can't help but send in $5, right? I said, show your students one of those, one of those commercials uh, and, 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 and see how they respond. And so, you know, I heard back from her and that's exactly what she did, right? She shows them that and she said, oh my goodness, Dr. Jeffrey, she was like, within 20 seconds, I got kids crying. They want to know what they can do and how could this happen? And how could people be so cruel, right? And what is that? That's empathy. But what's the difference? How come they can react like that to cats and dogs and they can't react like that to human beings? Because we have conditioned our children in society to be empathetic towards animals, more, towards, more empathetic towards animals than we have to be empathetic towards uh, people of color and, and people who do not look like them. I mean, just think about it from, we're giving them stuffed animals. We're talking about how cute and cuddly dogs and cats and kittens are and how we talk to them about treating animals, uh, uh, not, not treating them cruelly and being kind and how, how lovable, all the affirmations, all the positive affirmations that we, what we talk about and share about animals that we never do with children of color, that we never do with black and brown people. And, and so that creates this empathy gap, right? So empathy, yes, yeah, certainly is a human, is a human uh, a trait, right? That we're, that we're kind of born with, but it's fostered and developed, right? And, and one, on one hand, we can enhance it, on the other hand, uh, we can depress it. Uh, and that's what we have done. And so talking about resistance is a way to generate a uh, greater sense and form of empathy. When we're walking through this history, it's important that uh, we uh, acknowledge that we are still living with the legacies of slavery. Uh, and this manifests itself in one of two ways. Uh, the first one of the legacies, principal legacies of slavery is the desire and the willingness on the part of African-Americans to fight for basic civil rights and human rights. Like black folk didn't wake up uh, after emancipation and say, huh, 
I guess we should uh, sort of secure our basic civil rights and humans. No, they were fighting for their freedom before slavery, on a judge and the many others. And they're fighting for uh, their basic civil rights and human rights, what I call freedom rights after slavery. Right now, this is important. This notion that people had to fight, that black people had to fight uh, to gain uh, recognition of these basic civil rights and human rights is so critically important because if we just, if we never talk about this struggle and this fight, then change becomes natural. Progress becomes perpetual, right? And that's one of the things that we have to fight against, the myth of perpetual progress, that things change uh, just on their own. And while absolutely we have ha seen major change in American society, slavery's not here, we've gotten over Jim Crow, Right. We, we, we have we get we had a black president, like all that are signs of progress and change. But none of that just happened because of the passage of time. Time in and of itself is not a social force. It's not capable of changing anything when it comes to society. We saw change because people exerted a social force. People forced the issue led by black folk creating these things. Now, that's critically important because if we just default back, to the arc of moral universe being long and bending towards justice, if we default back to things just change on their own, what we're actually giving our permission, what we're actually doing is giving students permission to do nothing as citizens in this society, to do nothing to address the issues that they face. Uh, we, we're giving them permission to sit on the sidelines. Uh, and then we wonder why uh, voter turnout uh, in the United States uh, rarely passes 60%. Uh, or two thirds. Hopefully uh, we'll see something different in this election uh, yet to be determined. But we have to challenge and empower our children to make change uh, for whatever the issue is. And by talking about sort of the legacies of slavery and, and black folk wanting to fight, uh, we are able to get there. But we also have to talk about the other side of the coin, uh, that one of the principal, if not the main legacy of the institution of slavery is a belief in white supremacy. And this just isn't an ideology that sort of exists that some people may have believed in here and there, that we have societies just like here in Ohio fighting to maintain the institution of, of, of white, fighting to maintain white supremacist um, informed institutions. Right. So in Springfield, just down the road from us, uh, we see uh, um, a, a racial massacre. We see them uh, in and this is all after slavery. Right. In the early 1900s, 1906. Uh, we see it in Cincinnati. Uh, we see it in attempts uh, in the suburbs in Cleveland, Ohio, and here in uh, central Ohio to maintain all white neighborhoods, uh, whether that is in uh, uh, sort of upper Arlington or Bexley and the like. Right. So we have to talk about the ways in which white supremacy gets uh, perpetuated. Right. And people are actually fighting hard to maintain it as an institution. Um, we have to talk about the American experience about being as being opportunities won as well as opportunities lost. This again pushes back against the myth of perpetual progress. The opportunities won, for example, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, major Supreme Court case, 1964, ruling that uh, constitution, uh, ruling that segregation education is unconstitutional. This is the result of a 30 or 25 year legal campaign right, to, to, to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson. But when I talk to my students and I, 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 I ask them, I said, well, what do you think happened uh, after the Brown decision with segregated schools? And they said, well, they desegregated. And I said, well, in what world did that happen? Right, we know for a fact that schools outside the South never desegregate. Uh, the, the, the Brown does not apply to them or subsequent orders uh, do not apply to them. Uh, and we also know uh, that in the South, that it would be 10 years before we see any significant or substantive desegregation. And in fact, what we see uh, are uh, concerted efforts uh, to maintain segregated schools. In a state like Virginia, uh, when, it, when it appeared that um, they actually may have to desegregate uh, in the late 1950s, they shut down, they closed the entire public school system rather than desegregate, right? So Part of what we need to talk about is, well, when we see progress stalled, when we see this opportunity won, then lost, that we have to be clear and identify, well, what are the reasons why, right? This goes back to both, yeah, there are some uh, people who are engaged in uh, uh, prejudicial activities and behaviors, but it's also, and we see that in the South, now we're not gonna let it happen, but it's also the structural 
the reason why segregation in uh, outside the South and in, in schools and in, in, in cities like Columbus, Ohio, uh, would be remain as segregated as they were because it was embedded and built into the structure in part by law, right? The state legislature saying that, yeah, you can build schools for black folk, uh, but many cities saying that they have to be segregated themselves. So it's always this tension between opportunities won in American history and opportunities lost. Teaching today is critically important, as I mentioned before. And that's just not talking about, <clears throat> that's just not talking about um, so literally the, the, you know, today, the literal moment we want to build up there, but it's talking about sort of how do we get to today in the post-emancipation era, right? And so, for example, um, and, and I love to use this example uh, in, in the classroom in particular, uh, looking at 1930s um, uh, housing uh, maps and redlining, right? This is the federal government, right? This is the federal government creating maps for every major metropolitan area in the United States in the 1930s and deciding which neighborhoods uh, will be eligible uh, for government-backed, government-supported uh, housing loans. We create wealth. The middle class in America gets created during the New Deal, uh, bank uh, uh, supported uh, and bolstered uh, by uh, government-guaranteed loans uh, to homeowners, uh, but, but only white homeowners were able, white people were able to get those loans. Uh, and this isn't just, well, how do you know? Because the government said so. The federal government writes it, you know, in the underwriting policies. Like, look, if you are in one of these red neighborhoods, that means that it's an all black neighborhood. You cannot get a, a loan that will be backed up by the government, period. Right. I mean, so we see then how housing uh, gets reinforced, how segregated housing gets reinforced, gets built up in the 20th century uh, through these purposeful actions, right, that then aren't just unfortunate because black folk can't live to white, li live next to white folk. It's significant because it keeps African Americans from being able to build up wealth uh, as a, 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 and, and enter into the middle class and then beyond. Because for Americans, certainly for the last 75 years since the New Deal era, uh, uh, wealth, uh, the primary source of wealth generation has been home ownership. Uh, and so we've been living with that legacy. So teaching today also means looking at the immediate sources for inequality in American society. And of course, you know, connected to that, um, we'll, we'll talk about some of these other issues, but two more quick slides and I will talk about what we can do about some of these things. Uh, teaching today also means, and thinking about, I'm thinking about the election here, uh, that we talk about politics. Like we can't be afraid to talk about politics with our kids, right? I guess just like, you know, civics, public education, right? One of the, one of the core sources, this is going back to the founders, right? So, you know, yeah, I beat up on the founders, but the founders had some, had some good ideas, right? One of the core things that the founders believed, right? In public education, our thoughts about public education evolve over time is that public education should teach civics. Public edu education should prepare um, n n not patriotism, but civics, citizenship, good citizenship. And we can't do that if we're afraid to talk about politics, right? And, 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 and I'm not talking about, talking about politics in a partisan way. I'm just talking about what do we see? Help our students, give our students the tools to analyze what it is that they're seeing, right? Now, every, the, the, the cool thing, I don't know how about y'all, I don't know how about you all feel uh, in, in the various grades that you have, but one of the cool things about um, teaching uh, uh, college uh, is that you're always around young people, right? And we can have these candid and con candid conversations. But, the, but I'm beginning to realize uh, now that I'm, I'm, I'm coming up on 50 years old that I get older, but they stay the same age, right? Like they haven't aged. I'm still fooling around with these 18, 19 year olds, right? 20 years later. Uh, but what does change is their frame of reference, right? So now, you know, there was a time when, you know, students didn't Forget about 9-11, right? Like they, they, that's, that's, that's ancient history. But their first political memory, right? Now for students who are entering college and certainly uh, not even for students uh, who, are, who are K through 12 uh, is, you know, Obama's election, right? Like they, they, they had the vague sort of recollection of a freshman, a first year student, uh, a vague recollection of what happened uh, with the Obama years. But it's important, especially in this moment that we live in now and for the foreseeable future, right? It will change what we need to be teaching and focusing on. Uh, but that what we saw then, uh, regardless of policy, was an, an effort around the politics of hope, right? Like that was the marshalling of the alliance, right? The political alliance about the politics of hope. 
But that wasn't. And it was very effective. I mean, the president gets two terms. But that didn't mean that all the issues confronting African-Americans had been solved. Right. So Black Lives Matter as an idea, as a slogan, uh, as a series of independent organizations doesn't begin during the Trump administration. It begins during the Obama administration. Why? Uh, Because mass incarceration was still a problem. Uh, The harmful effects of the war on drugs was still a problem. Police violence was still a problem. All of these issues right, still existed, even though we had this more hopeful uh, political language that was emanating from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, But the current moment that we are living in now is fundamentally different. We went from the politics of hope uh, to the politics of hate. Uh, And again, we can't be shy from talking about this, right, because our kids see it. And what they need to do is we have to help. Or they, and they're trying to make sense of it. That's why you got 35 million people taken to the streets. Uh, and we have, to, we have to help them process this, right? And, and so here's an image of the uh, 2017 uh, white supremacist rally in Charlottesville uh, that, that occurs under the, under the auspices of trying to prevent people to remove those Confederate monuments, a series of Confederate monuments going back to those symbols of white supremacy. Uh, in Charlottesville, North Carolina, but it was just a rally for, it was a white supremacist rally, right? In which uh, a young uh, anti-racist uh, uh, activist, Heather Heyer gets killed uh, by a resident from Ohio, right? I mean, so this isn't, again, this isn't something that just happens in the South. So what is this? And what, how do we get to the politics of hate? And we also have to be clear that what we are seeing emanating from the White House, and again, this isn't partisan, this is just what it is, right? Is that Uh, The current president of the United States is using racism, in particular, the politics of hate uh, to to animate uh, many Americans. And this isn't actually a surprise because we know from history that racism is, in fact, the most powerful political organizing tool that America has ever created. Period. Like, that's it. And that's what we're seeing being marshaled and animated. And it's not going to go anywhere. And this isn't something that the current occupant of the White House uh, invented. He didn't invent uh, hate no more than uh, his his predecessor, Barack Obama, invented hope. Uh, But both are using it uh, in various ways for various political ends. And our students need to understand the difference. So what should we do? How should we then, knowing this this history, knowing these this this critical starting point around how do we need to talk about race and racism? What do we do? How do we approach this? Well, the first thing we do uh, or not do is follow the usual responses to hard history. And I'm defining hard history as this this is not only the stuff that happens in the past, slavery. Right. But how do we how do we how do we respond to the current moment? How do we respond to racial terrorism and white supremacist violence? Right. Whether it's in Charlottesville uh, or in or in Pittsburgh or in El Paso, Texas. Like, what do we do? The first thing we can't pretend (laughs) that stuff doesn't exist. Right. Purposeful historical amnesia. We cannot pretend, for example, uh, that white supremacy wasn't informing the reason why Ohio refuses uh, to permit slavery uh, in uh, as it comes into the union. Right. His purposeful historical amnesia. We cannot pretend that stuff in the past that actually happened just didn't exist. We have to stop rationalizing evil. That doesn't that does no one any good. Right. And we see this all the time. Right. When we have, you know, a, a terrorist shooting or the such. Uh, and we say, oh, that was just one person, that was just one actor. Or we look back in, uh, as opposed to being a function of a society that created this individual. Or we look back at slavery, and one of the most common things, and I've, done a, a, I've had the fortune of working with a number of uh, uh, historic sites, presidential homes in particular, uh, and one of the things that uh, when you talk to the docents there, uh, and you say, well, how do people respond uh, when they... When they uh, when you tell them about a Jefferson or, or a Madison uh, owning, claiming ownership over people, and they say, well, the number one thing is they say, well, well wasn't, they, wasn't he a good master? Wasn't he a good master? Right? Like, there's no such thing as a good master. There's no such thing as somebody as being good if you're owning people. The very fact of owning people, right, that is predicated on the use of violence to keep them uh, in, in place, to keep them in bondage, uh, means that you surrender that title of goodness. Right. But that's an attempt to rationalize evil. And there's no reason to do that other than to protect some type of personal uh, sort of in- intellectual investment uh, in who they were at the time. Right. The other the other thing that we hear all the time is, well, they were just men of their times. They're just doing what everybody else did. Well, 
you know, in 1865, there are 4 million people who are in bondage who would have, if you would have asked them, well, what do you think about slavery? They'd have been like, yeah, no, right? I mean, so this isn't a presentist argument, right? Even the Jeffersons and the Madisons, even during their time, right? Like just men of their time, we hear this all the time. Even during their time, uh, they had friends, uh, their boys, right? Who they have over for lunch and dinner and Dolly Madison giving them ice cream that enslaved folk were making in the kitchen. Uh, they told them, they told them, that what they were doing was wrong. Jefferson, Madison, they're all right, right about. Yeah, we know this is wrong. So this is, you know, when we think about the origins, this isn't about that, that critical eye, that critical critique, isn't about projecting contemporary views. It's looking at people on their own terms, in their own moment. Uh, and we realize that, no, there's no reason to sort of rationalize uh, the evil of the past to make us feel comfortable in the present. And then lastly, we have to uh, push back hard against just creating false narratives. That's what the lost cause is. That's just making stuff up. We can't just make stuff up, right? Because it suits a particular political agenda or purpose and then hang on to it, right? Lost cause narrative, you know, is over almost 150 years old now, right? Like enough already. Like we know it ain't true, right? So we have to move away from creating these false narratives because the result is that they wind up perpetuating myths and misconceptions, right? And it's not just that they perpetuate them, but that these myths and misconceptions actually promote and reinforce uh, racial bias and inequality, right? So there, so when we, when, we, when we used, when we default back to these responses, we're actually doing harm. Remember that Hippocratic oath, do no harm. We're actually doing harm because we're perpetuating these myths that provide a rationalization and justification for inequality. So what should we do? And I'll run through these real quick, these seven, seven principles I, I, I call for, for teaching about race and racism, I call them the seven Bs, the seven Bs. These are seven things, practical things, practical approaches uh, that we should be thinking about in the classroom that apply to teachers at all ages, right? Teachers of all age groups. So this is what I have to do. Uh, and this is what, uh, you know, kindergarten teachers have to do all ages. First one, uh, language matters. We have to be clear. The first B, you have to be clear. What are we talking about when we're talking about race and racism? So for example, uh, we need to be talking about uh, not just slaves, as I mentioned before, or referring to African-Americans who are in bondage solely as slaves. We need to be talking about enslaved people, right? Use language that humanizes and also use language that doesn't let people off the hook, right? So we're instead of talking about slave owners or slave masters, we need to talk about enslavers, right? The action uh, of an active participation uh, of participating in something such as the institution of slavery. So the language that we use is so critically important. Now, there's some things that we have to say, and there's some things that we have to, that we shouldn't say. The N word, for example, right? There's language that we just shouldn't use. And I don't care if it's in a text or you're reading James Baldwin or Richard Wright and they're using it, you just don't use it. My kids, particularly among the older students, right? They're, they're old enough to read it. They know what it is. You just don't have to give it voice and power. Uh, because you, you never know how others in the classroom and certainly outside of the classroom will use that as a springboard to do a springboard to do harm. Right. And so we're not at the point uh, where we can look at it and just assume good intention and neutrality. And especially for our, our black students with, with and, if, and if the teachers are white, like we can't assume um, the you know, good intention. Right. Because our students are projecting uh, onto our white teachers with good reason. Right. The larger issues. Um, that society holds. And so we just want to avoid those terms. We want to avoid that language. Uh, we don't want to give it uh, voice or, 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 or give it power uh, through voice. We have to be positive. Oh, this is so critically important, right? Because we live in a world in which uh, racial stereotypes still persist. And have we made progress? Absolutely, we've made progress, but we still live in a world in which racial stereotypes persist. Uh, and so our children, even the youngest learners are coming into the classroom uh, with these negative stereotypes. So we have to do our level best uh, to combat those stereotypes with positive images, positive language, uh, positive stories, right? To bring that balance, right? So we have to be positive when talking about race. It's not just enough to say, hey, we're gonna talk about all the hardships that black folk have faced. We need to talk about race and the, the positive experiences of racialized groups in American society. Third, we gotta be personal, right? And this, is, this, is, this can be hard, uh, but it, it, it's really important. Uh, not only for, for all teachers, but especially for white teachers, right? 
when talking about race and racism, to share your story, um, to share your story about the things that you have learned over the course of your lifetime, the things that you did wrong in the past, the things that you now do right, beliefs that you held, because that's giving our students permission to be wrong. And that's so important. Of course, we want to teach them to be right. But it, we have to teach them it's OK to be wrong because we know that a lot of the beliefs that they have will be misguided uh, in part just because they live in this society. Right. So sharing your story is giving them the permission to grow if we share the ways in which we have grown. Right. And also saying, like, yo, look, this is a, I, I'm, I'm on a journey too, right? to continue to to continue to live, but also to continue to learn. Right, so that being personal is so very important. But also part of being personal, we're going to talk about race and racism is, is acknowledging your own racial identity, right? Like, like, especially for white, especially for white teachers. Like you can't, you can't walk, you can't, you can't ask your, it's unfair to ask your students to have a serious conversation about race and racism and you've never actually identified or said or verbalized or articulated what your own racial identity is, what your racial heritage is, right? But once you do that, now suddenly you're, you're breaking down that, bar that barrier, Right. Of saying, hey, this is a place where we can have this conversation. We can give voice to these terms. Right. We don't have to be shy about this. Now, within that, of course, there are students um, who you in, in, in any situation. Right. In any class, it's important to understand your classroom dynamics. And it's important to understand, you know, sort of which students you have to protect uh, and which students you're going to have to correct. Uh, that, that's 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 teaching 101. Uh, but it's also important on this question of race and racism that we start where students are. Right. Ask them the questions. What are they thinking? What do they believe? What have they heard? Now, some of it's going to be crazy, but then that's the function of teaching. Right. Where do we want to go from there? And this is across subjects. Right. No matter how we do this uh, or where, the context that we're teaching, we have to be open, figure out where they are and then build on that. Be specific in our language. And this is very specific when we're talking about racism, when we see manifestations that are both sometimes personal and sometimes structural, be able to uh, be able to identify uh, the difference between the two. And be intentional. And this is so important. Right. Be intentional about how we approach um, these subjects. Right. This isn't we're not going to do drive by teaching. Right. We just drop in one day, uh, teach the subject and then move on. No, we're going to think about how do we plan this over the course of a semester in the school year? How do we plan this across curriculum so that what we're doing in, in ELA is reinforcing what we're doing in history, which is reinforcing what we're doing in music? Right. What songs are we singing in there? What's the history of this of the language and the songs and the folk art and the folk, the folk music and the like? So we want to scaffold across across throughout our class, across our curriculum. And then, of course, we have to scaffold vertically. Right. Uh, across the grades. That is so critically important, because what we do now uh, is 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 really unlike any other subject, whether we're, if we're teaching English or we're teaching mathematics, you know, we don't wait to high school to teach core principles. We're not waiting until a kid shows up in calculus to teach the basics of, of addition and subtraction, right? But that's what we do with history. That's what we do with race and racism. We'll wait till the eighth grade to start talking about institution slavery. And the kids are like, well, what is this about? No, we build on subjects of fairness and justice and inequality, age appropriate ways from kindergarten all the way to the top. Our kids are, our kids are ready for it. Uh, it's us, you know, who have the hesitancy uh, and who aren't ready to teach it. And then lastly, we gotta be proactive got to engage community, right? This means parents, right? Letting them know up front, this is what we're doing. This is what we're going to be teaching. And this is why we're teaching it. That is so critically important to get that community buy-in. Let them know this isn't some subversive activity. We're doing what our charge is, right? To help our students understand uh, the past and the present and to prepare them for the future. Um, so those are the seven principles. There's actually an eighth principle. So I kind of lied. But seven is just such a good holy number. That's a good spiritual number. So we're just going to call it seven. But there's an eighth one. And the eighth one is what I learned from my daughter, who's a gymnast, 10 year old gymnast. Uh, and right before the uh, shutdown, uh, we were at a meet uh, and she's she's actually pretty good. Um, uh, and her favorite routine, the best routine is the floor exercise. Uh, and right before she was about, anybody knows anything about gymnasts, gymnastics, right before her, her, her tumbling pass. Right. Which is really excels at. I'm watching her and I noticed that there's like brief moment of hesitation. And I, you know, the parent in me, you know, got a little nervous. I was like, oh my God, did she forget what to do? Like what just happened? And, and then she takes off and she, she crushes this tumbling pass uh, and she scores her highest routine, uh, her highest score of, of the season, right? And then the world collapsed and that was the end of that. But while we were driving home, right? And we're talking about the meat and everything. I remember that moment of hesitation, right? 
And I said, I said, Asha, I said, what? I said, what happened? I said, I noticed like right before you're about to do your tumbling pass. I was like, did you forget? Did you get nervous? I said, what happened? And she said, she said, oh, no, no. She said, you know, right before I started the pass, I was thinking that I was having a really good routine and that if I really wanted to score to get my highest score, that I had to I had to really go for it. And so she said, so she said, I just told myself, be bold and go for it. And that's what we have to do in this moment when it comes to teaching about race and race. And we got We have to tell ourselves to be bold in this moment, that if we want to be effective in the classroom, if we want to teach this history uh, accurately and effectively, that now is the time to be bold. Uh, are we going to have you know, some some stumbles? Absolutely. Give ourselves permission uh, to make some mistakes. Uh, but be bold in the effort. That's what our students uh, not only are demanding by the millions who have been taken to the streets, but it's also what our young people uh, across across Westerville, across Ohio, across the country actually deserve. Uh, and we can meet that both what they demand and what they deserve by being bold in our approach and by being bold in our teaching. Uh, and so I've, I've left us a robust five minutes uh, for, for, for any questions or comments or uh, questions, uh, but I'll stop sharing now and, and I welcome uh, anyone who has anything to, to, to say or share. You can just unmute your mic and just hop on in. So I have a question. Yes. So um, I teach in elementary school and I noticed that there is a big issue, um, especially with my population of students that like the second we mention race, it's just racist. That's racist, that's racist, yeah. that's racist. The second race is even mentioned. Like I had a student last year, we had a black um, instructional aide and he's like, do you get sunburned? And the other students are like, that's racist. You can't ask him that. And I'm like, no, that's not racist. He's just asking him a question. So I guess how can we promote that like at an elementary level, like K-5 students that like yep. being open about it is okay. But then where does the line draw when it becomes racist? Yeah, no, again, I think, I think we actually have to encourage our children to talk about it because that's exactly what we don't want to happen, right? We don't, that's, that's, that's building towards this pseudo colorblindness. Like everybody knew the instructional aid was black. Right. Like that wasn't a shot. Right. But we're just going to pretend that there is somehow difference. Now, again, the question, especially for young learners. Right. They're still formulating. How do I frame something? And that's where sort of the, the teacher intervention to correct, to say, no, no, no. What you're asking is this. or this is how you frame it. You got to be careful around this. That's where we become involved. But we want to encourage our children to ask these questions. We want to encourage our children not to duck their heads in the sand and pretend that it doesn't exist. So asking the question, mentioning race, again, is not a problem. And we have to be explicit in sharing that with our students. Like, it's not a problem. You can say it. You know who I am. I see who you are. There's no problem with that. It's the discrimination that becomes problematic. It's the projection of stereotypes onto people that becomes problematic. But the only way that we will know if they're harboring those myths and stereotypes, and we know they are, if they're not talking about them because the society is bombarding them, is if we get them to open up about them. And a lot of times, you know, one kid will say something uh, and others may not, but they believe the same thing. Right. But they're told not to say anything about it. Um, and so I think the shorter the short answer is like, no, no, no. We want to encourage it. It's not racist to say to talk about people's racial identity. It's racist to discriminate. It's racist to use the sort of the language and the like. But just talking about it, that's the way we get over it. We're so we're so wrapped up in our own heads. right? We can't get out our, our way. And now we're messing up a whole nother generation of kids. Right. By projecting our own insecurities and issues onto them. No, no, no. We got to get out of our way. Now, look, kids will say something crazy. Right. Like, I don't mess with elementary. Stuff. I don't mess with y'all, man, because these kids, they have me they'll chase me out of a room. Right. They'll say some crazy stuff. But that's where you can't you can't let stuff slide. You got to redirect just like we do with everything else. You redirect, you reposition, you reframe, and then they become better at it going forward. Any other questions? Like oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Go ahead, Allison. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to ask for a suggestion. Um, I am a building administrator in one of our middle schools, uh -huh. snuck into the elementary session. Um, we have a lot of students, black students who use the N word and you spoke about the N word. Yep. Um, 
and here I am a white lady telling them not to Allison, use that Allison, word. I, I, Allison, I can, I can, I mean, let me stop you right here. Cause <laughs> look, look I, I am, you know, having come out of African American community, I'm, I'm very familiar with people using the N word. No, stop it. Right. Stop it. That's not what we're not doing it. Right. And I have no problem saying that to the students. I guess yep. the problem is when I call their parents and their parents say, no, we tell them that that's, that that's okay to say. Now, look, and I'm not sure how to address that with parents. I, I, well, look, the parent thing is a parent thing, right? You say, look, if you tell them that's fine, that that's up to you, right? Like I grew up in a household where I knew there were certain things that I could say when I was in the street and there were certain things I could say when I was in grandma's house, right? Uh, and, or in church, right? And we're at, and, and I think in the conversation with the parents, especially parents of color, it's like, look, you know, I'm not telling you what to tell your child, right? To say inside, to say outside of school or in your home, that, that's up to you. What we're saying is that this is problematic in the classroom because of the in the school setting because of the way in which others can then use it to create harm, right? Mm -hmm. And when you hear and, and, and having black students talk about it, you know, white students will take even if then there's no malicious intent among the black students among the black kids, which we know, then the white students will then use it as permission to create harm to use mm -hmm. it in a harmful way, and that is the problem. So now look, now I'm not a zero tolerance person, right? So I'm not saying now we got to go every time you hear it because it's so built into the subculture uh, of society now that among black students that now you got to throw them out of school. No, but you have to build up a culture in the school where you're like, no, 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 the intervention, no, we're not using that in here. Right. And, and it, you know, it, it may be part of a broader conversation that you have to have with the students as a whole saying this is why we're not going to do it. And this is why we're going to stop when we hear it. We need you to help poli not, not police, but we need to, everybody to bring it down and keep it out of the classroom. Now, kids as a whole are going to need to be able to become sort of racially bilingual anyway, right? Like black kids, white kids, everybody's going to have to be able to dance in and out of these languages, but especially for black kids too, right? So they're going to have to develop that anyway. So I, I think I think you're right in saying we're not going to use it. When you talk to parents, like, look, I'm not telling you not, I'm just saying this is what we're doing in the classroom because we don't want to give permission to anybody else to use it uh, and manipulate the use of sort of uh, how it is being used among African-Americans. So I think Thank your you. inclination is absolutely right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe I know it's 11 o'clock. Maybe we have time for, for one more. I just had a comment. Yes. Because um, I just think that it's important to share the positive experiences as well. Oh, yeah. Because I... Um, I'm a graduate of Westerville City Schools, mm -hmm. and I was the only black person in the entire middle school and the only black person in my graduating class. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we do have to, I mean, there were negative things that happened, but I think we also need to share, because I had a great experience in, in middle school and high school. So I think we, you know, along with sharing those negative experiences, we need to also share the positive, you yeah, know. You know I, if we know, have the opportunity to share, you know, we have to share those as well. Yeah, no, I, I think it's always critically important to balance. So you have to create balance yeah. between um, the hardship uh, and the hope, right? Because if we only focus on the hardship, particularly for African-American students, for, 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 for students of color, then they don't want to identify with the group, right? Because, you know, I literally had this conversation with my daughter, my, young, my, my youngest daughter, because I'm always experimenting with my kids, right? How do I teach this? Like, nothing I'm telling y'all, I haven't tried all my kids, right? Mm -hmm. My daughter, you know, who's four or five years old about slavery. And I'm like, yeah, this is what slavery was, this, that, and the other. And she was like, and all because people were black. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm thinking I'm doing something good. And she was like, well, then I don't want to be black. And I was like, oh, that wasn't a takeaway I was trying to go for, right? And why? Because I was, only, I was hitting it with the hardship, right? Like, yeah, I wouldn't want to be black either if that was the case. So we don't want to force anything, but there's always balance, right? The way yeah. in which black folk have been able to survive all these years, even in tough situations, sometimes that are good, sometimes are bad, is by, is by creating hope and joy, right? Love in addition to the pain. So right. we have to share that experience. And sometimes it's an individual experience surrounded by white folk, but sometimes it's just black folk being among black folk. Like it's okay for black folk to be among black folk. I right. guess this, this last thing I would say uh, is, you know, the Westerville is very unique in terms of its uh, racial demographic and 50% 50, 50 or so black and 25% and or so African-American is that, you know, we look at the, you know, we look at sort of cafeteria dynamics when we were all in school and you see the black kids over in the corner, and you're like, well, why don't black kids sit by themselves, right? We create a loving environment. It's like, because, you know, black folk, black kids have to survive, right? And, and constantly being in these environments 
uh, surrounded by white folk can be very stressful. I don't know if white folk, I don't know if my dear white friends on this Zoom call understand how stressful white people can be, right? And so our kids are just simply finding a way uh, to breathe a little bit. And we wanna look for ways to encourage them uh, to breathe for themselves, right? And so, cause if they can breathe, they can learn. And I think everybody becomes, we become better, better educators uh, and they become better students and we can fulfill our mission. Uh, Cause that's what, and, and our mission is all, you know, we share the same mission, right? We wanna make better students, better people, better citizens. So I think at 11 o'clock, I think I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity to share some thoughts and ideas. And if you have any follow-up questions, by all means, just, just reach out, um, you know, via email or social media and, I'll, and we can continue the conversation from there. Well, so again, Dr. Jeffries, thank you, thank you, thank you for um, your presentation and the wealth of information that you shared with our staff. We truly um, enjoyed your presentations and we will look forward to continuing our partnership um, for future trainings for staff. So staff, thanks to you as well for participating and even staying a few minutes after 11. Don't forget to do your Google form. Take care, everyone. Bye. Don't forget to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. Dr. Jeffries, do you have time oh. for another question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. As long um, as they don't cut it off, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I was just wondering, I know that um, like an issue that's been talked about is disproportionately disciplining uh, minority students. And yeah. Um, like even within my, my own school, I know that I, I typically do see um, more of like my African-American students um, stay, staying in from recess with me even in the past. And um, like, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, what, what ways might my behavior management techniques be ineffective with this? Because I feel like I have these really strong relationships with the kids. And, you know, when we talk about it, like we have good conversation about choices and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then it seems like a cycle that repeats. And I like I don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, you know, it's hard to say. Well, how old, how old are the kids that you're fifth, uh, how old? Grade. fifth grade? Your know, fifth grade is hard to say. Yeah, fifth grade is hard. Anyway. <laughs> Part of part of what, you know, I, I, there's always there's always a balance, right, between, um, and I understand classroom management, right, between you know showing grace, um, having flexibility, uh, knowing that kids learn in different ways and different styles, and have you know different um, ways of approaching learning and interacting with one another. Um, there has to be um, you have to maintain order. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I get that. Right. I totally get that in the classroom. I think part of and, and, and the way you do that is by sort of, you know, the, the firm, um, um, you know, setting, setting, setting the standards, setting like this is what we do. This is what we don't do. This is why we do it. This is why we don't do it. Right. Explaining, you know, why, you know, the certain you know codes of conduct and, you know, how you how you manage a classroom with it takes a while. Like, I don't think it's enough just to say, hey, this is what we do and this is why we don't do it. And if you do it again, you're getting held after, right? Like that then becomes problematic, right? And it, it, I think what you're doing, Nicole, you said, you know, you're having these conversations. Like, that's what you do, right? You have the conversation. So students understand, well, what, okay, what's the problem here, right? Mm -hmm. Because we also have different standards in different classrooms, right? I mean, just because we're human beings, right? We, we operate differently. We interact with children differently. And so making clear what your expectations are, what your standards are, and not being so quick, um, not saying that you are, but in general, not being so quick to send a kid, uh, you know, to, to, to give them that harsh disciplinary punishment. We know for a fact, uh, the Justice Department uh, did a study just a couple years ago, and they were like, this disproportionate disciplinary action uh, is occurring for children of color in preschool, in preschool. So that means that this isn't just we're not this isn't just what kids are doing. What we're doing is projecting onto kids motivation and intent. Right. And so that's where we have to become a little bit more self-reflective. Is this just a kid who's tired? Right. Or is this a kid who's who, who is purposely trying to be disruptive? Right. I mean, like that's where we have to you know, do a little bit more of our uh, you know, a little bit more introspection on ourselves. Like if this kid was a little white girl, we we just give a little bit more grace. Than if it's a young black boy, right? I mean, so there we just now some of it maybe this kid just acting up, right? Like okay, you yeah, I'm 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 down, I'm okay with dropping the hammer, right? 
not 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 dragging them out in, ch- in, in handcuffs. Right. Yeah. But but being strong and, and firm, you got to maintain control of the classroom. But I think we do have to in our individual cases. Like, OK, am I just reacting to this? Right. Am I defaulting back because I'm in some sort of stressful situation? And I don't need I don't have the time to have a deep introspective thought. But am I just reacting to this or do or is this just a kid who's just tired? Right. Or is this a kid who's just expressing themselves in a different way? And so I think if we're just, as you said, two things, talking to the kids, being clear about what the expectations are and setting those expectations high, kids will rise to high expectations if they believe that the expectations are being set not to punish, but but to advance them, but to help them. They will rise to that no matter who they are. And I think they have to be aware of that. So we share the expectations with them. And then before we before we jump to a conclusion, we have a little self check in like, all right, you know, this is how I feel like reacting. But is that fair? Uh, And then I think, you know, and then I think we can can move away. One of the things that becomes difficult, though, is that you're also not interacting with your kids just in isolation. So sometimes we see children uh, and, and and this is why that preschool thing, right? You're disciplining kids at this early age when kids, any child, but it, especially we see it more often with children of color, that when they're told that they are disciplined, uh, that they are a disciplinary problem, then, then mm-hmm. they will become a disciplinary problem, mm-hmm. right? And that will carry over from class to class to class because one that, and many times we see that's a way for them to get the only attention that they get Right. I mean, so that becomes so you can be saying everything right. Right. But then that breaks down because of what else is going on in somebody else's classroom or how they're being treated in the hallways or else. So so part of the part of why it becomes a challenge uh, is because it has to be a collective effort. Right. I mean, it has to be a school wide sort of approach to say, okay, let's look at our numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what we're doing. And if we see something askew, we know that we have to buck these trends. And then how can we do that collectively? So we're not so we're not putting these kids in this cycle of discipline that then leads them not to want to learn. So I know you talked about like setting the high expectations and the power of language. Is there is there any language like you gave examples with, you know, instead of slave owners, people who enslaved other people um, with setting those high expectations and stuff that you've seen be especially effective? Oh, yeah. Just to, you could just say, I think you're smart. I know you're smart. The positive affirmations. You don't know how many. You know how many how many times, um, you know, uh, black children have never been told that they're smart, right? I mean, just just literally some those. That's what I'm saying. The negative stereotypes. Those mm-hmm. positive affirmations. I believe in you. I know you can do this. I mean, that helps every student, but it especially is important with children of color because they don't hear it. They don't see the signals. Like on television and, 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 and the ways in the larger society is not signaling to them. Like you don't need to tell them that they're a good basketball player. Like I bet you're good on the basketball court. Right. They get that all the time. But they don't have. You know what? You, I, I think you're a really good reader. Right. I mean, those positive affirmations are so important because what what will that then do? That then moves you as the instructor into a different category. Right. Like Miss Nicole, like she's somebody who actually believes in me. So I'm going to pay attention a little bit more. A lot of the. Actual disciplinary problems, like a lot of di- a lot of stuff that kids get disciplined for are not actually disciplinary problems. Like that's projection stuff. Right. I mean, that, that has more to do with us. But sometimes you do have real disciplinary issues. Right. That that, you know, that if they're not created by the outside of the classroom. Right. It's because kids have built up this expectation that that's how they are to act and perform. Right. It becomes performance and we reinforce it. But when you break that down with those positive affirmations, right, then I think you begin to see the children, you know, wanting to meet those new expectations, with, which isn't just I'm not going to act up, but I'm going to do my best. And that's what we want. Like fifth graders, I mean, you know, in essence, you got to give them to these intellectual hugs, right? Like tell them, you know, you know, I'm with you. I'm on your team. I want you to do this. I believe that you can do it. So it's not always just I want, but I believe I see it. I've seen it in you. Right. Like that then translates into those disciplinary um, uh, uh, ameliorating some of those disciplinary issues. Thanks. Thank you. That's really that's helpful to think about how how my my language could change there, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I I mean, I think I th- that's one of those areas I think we all can really work on what we say and how we say it and how often we say it to our, to our students and to young people. 
yeah, be, being intentional with, with my words more. Being intentional with the words. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, look, I, I'm teaching, teaching at Ohio State. You know, if, if I tell them, and I've, I've actually, I've, I, sh- I probably shouldn't be admitting this, but I've done this in the past, right? Just to see what would happen, right? I've told my students and before, like before a class, two different classes, giving them the same test. Mm-hmm. I told them, I told one, one set of students one year, I said, this is a really difficult test. And I really wouldn't be surprised if y'all didn't do very well, right? And I, just, I mean, I hit them over the head, right? Like, ah, the classes, the, the questions that you have been asking haven't been, done, been, haven't been very well, haven't been very good, very strong. So, you know, it just is what it is. Do your best, you know, see you next time. And what happened? They performed poorly mm-hmm. right? because they literally were like, ah, oh, you know, I guess this is what's going to happen. If it's difficult, rise to the challenge. Did the same class, same test. And all I did was tell them about how well they were going to do because they had been doing so well in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like, man, I believe in this class. I'm always giving pep talks to my students. Right? They're like, Dr. Jay, why are you just giving pep talks? I'm like, yeah, because y'all do better when I give you a pep talk. And then what happens? Then you see them perform well. Now, look, a student who doesn't study isn't going to do well. But the student who is trying will do better. Like that positive affirmation is so critically important. And you see it. And I mean, I literally the same test, same essential group of students. Right. And they're like, oh, yeah, we rocked it. I'm like, great. You know, we have to setting those expectations. Right. Because, because sometimes, and it, it certainly, I mean, I, I don't know if it's, it, it may be a, a correlation in, in, the, uh, in the K through 12, but I certainly, I see it in college, right? Like I tell my students, you know, first day of class, one day I'm going to have a class in which everybody earns an A. Everybody gets an A. And they're like, oh, you know, students clutching the pearls. Wait, what do you mean? Like, you can do that? And I'm like, yes. Like I live for the day. Right. When I get called into the chairman's office, the chairperson's office, like everybody got an A. I'm like, yeah, they work really hard. Like, that's what I want as a teacher for everybody to succeed. But but we have students who are like, oh, well, I guess I can't do it. We're projecting our, you know, only a certain number of students should should excel and succeed. That's nonsense. Right. We want everybody to do their very best. And I think when we're intentional about sharing like that as an as a goal, for our students and then pulling students aside. We're like, look, man, I need you to do better. You can do better. I know you can do better. I think that goes a long way, right? Especially as they move through, right? The, the elementary and then middle school and then certainly, certainly about high school. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I, if, if you end up still having time, I did have another question, but it looks like other people have some, so I'm going to mute. <laughs> okay. Did anybody else have any thoughts in the, or questions? Yeah, we just hanging out. Yeah, that's what my that's what my students have done now, right? We're a two hour, we have a two hour class, and then I'm like, all right, y'all, and like Dr. Jeffers, can we hang out a little while? I'm like, y'all, what are you having Zoom? Y'all missing people, right? So we go on for, but it's the, the moment that we're living in, right? Like you gotta have. I'm I'm stuck here talking to three kids, so we can we can talk a little longer <laughs> if we want. I do have a question. Yes, Rachel. So I am a second year teacher this year. So I just graduated from Ohio State in May of 2019. Um, And I posed a question in my equity and diversity class in one of my last semesters about when to use black or when to use Mm -hmm. African-American. And no one was able to answer the question for me. Like they told me, well, you should ask them what their preference is. And I'm like, but if I'm teaching like, do I go, hey, so-and-so, what do you prefer to be called? Because no one asks me, like, do I want to be called white or Irish American? Because that's my culture, you know? Like, right. what do I do about my kids that were born here in Columbus versus my kids that were born in Somalia? Right, right. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And so first, I think the recognition is that names and labels are all political. Like, I mean, sort of these what we call ourselves, like have political roots and, and, and meaning. Um, I think in general, like when you have native born Africans, right? So obviously Columbus, Ohio is second largest Somali population in the United States. Then we're talking about a different kind, if you will, right? You have an African born, uh, you know, a, 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 an immediate uh, immigrant from Africa. So that's a different kind of African-American. So I think in that sense, like if a person is, you know, of Somali descent, then he's a Somali descent in this generation now. Uh, I think the bigger, so the African-American community, right, that you can use interchangeably, right? So people of African descent who are born here in the United States and have been here uh, for multiple generations, that I think you can be them, us, I, you can comfortably refer to 
as either black or African American. I think when we, the, the, the advantage of black uh, capitalized uh, is that it provides a more diasporic reach, right? It, it, can, it, it can be inclusive of, of people from the African diaspora. You know, the actual term would be uh, a person of African descent born in the United States, right? But who's walking around saying, hello, it's very nice to meet you, person of African descent born in the United States, right? right. So we, we shorthand that uh, to, to black, black people, black folk, a black person, or African-American to refer to African-Americans, people of color, of African descent who have been born in the United States for you know for uh, a couple generations dating back to slavery or even more recently, um, and then uh, if we because we don't know a specific count country of origin, right? Like I I, I I can't my DNA says I got some people from Ni Nigeria, but that ain't really helping me, right? Uh, but if you have children now who are children of parents who were immigrated from migrate immigrated from Somalia. Uh, or Ethiopia or Eritrea, I mean, they are able to identify that, then it's totally fine. They're like a person, of, and they're born here, Somali American, right? Um, now, individually, you can always ask, right? Or they may say, and you just be open to it. Okay, cool. I think in general, we say people of the African diaspora, if we're incorporating, we want to go global, African American, Black, if we want to think about local. Now, what we want to avoid, the only thing we need to avoid, we will avoid Negroes, we avoid coloreds, we avoid the N-word, and we avoid the objectification, right? So the article, right? The blacks, right? Like that's, I mean, it's short of that, then you're, you're, you're in safe, you're in safe ground. And, and most people don't have a hard objection. Most African-Americans, people born here for a couple of generations, uh, don't have a hard objection to either being black or African-American. I think part of the distinction though, uh, becomes when people um, of, uh, who are or newer immigrants from the diaspora I'm like, wait a minute, right? Like, don't erase my uh, country of origin, my country heritage that I'm able to identify, right? Like, we don't want to do that. And so there you get a little pushback. We want to acknowledge that. Uh, but then, you know, what they may not know uh, that, that we do know is that very soon they're going to be very Black. They're going to be very African-American, right? Because this is the way uh, race uh, and racial identity gets formed in America going forward. So not right now. Uh, but in, in due time. So it's a good question. Thank so you. That helps. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So maybe maybe one more, Nicole, that last question you had. Yeah, if, if nobody else um, wants to ask something. Okay, um, so just like over the last few years, I feel like I've been becoming more aware of like these racial and cultural issues. And it's still something where I feel like I don't know how much I don't know. Um, and so I guess just with wanting to, you know, even, even just be the best citizen and like person I can possibly be, but wanting to be knowledgeable of these topics for my students, um, do you do you have not only some just initial thoughts on like ways that we are still limiting the opportunities of minorities and African Americans in general, but also some recommendations for like as an educator, some resources I could go to to really start I like bettering my own practice and mm -hmm. just my personal knowledge of the topic. Yeah. So as as an educator. Um, I think I've, I've done some work with a lot of work the last couple of years with uh, teaching tolerance. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, familiar with them out of the a division. I've, I've heard of it. Yeah, not yeah. Familiar with it. Okay, yeah, you know, check it out. It's a division of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, it's their educational arm, uh, and they do wonderful uh, work and, and produce a number of materials um, for you know uh, culturally responsive pedagogy. Um, and, and not just sort of what to do, but then also resources and materials, how to teach um, about, um, you know, uh, bias and, and the like. So I would encourage you to check out Teaching Tolerance and their website. All their materials are free. They got videos and films, stuff that you can use in the classroom, but also educator uh, resources. I've been doing a, um, uh, a podcast with them for the last three years on teaching slavery and teaching civil rights, teaching hard history. I mean, so there's a number of sort of resources and materials that I would recommend and, and recommendations and books and they host webinars. So that's a great sort of resource. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, it's focused on K through 12. Um, and, and I still, I read all their stuff all the time. Um, and so they're wonderful. Uh, the Zen Education Project is also 
um, has a number of resources available through its websites. And D-I-N-N, Zinn, Z-I-N-N, and then slash uh, Teaching for Change. If you Google, like they have like wonderful stuff on social justice and anti-racism materials and book recommendations, um, especially for um, uh, young learners, so that fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, uh, and materials. So I think all of that, um, I think those are two great places to start. Um, and you'll get some really good resources, frameworks for teaching, uh, and the like. What was that first one you said? Um, teaching tolerance. Thank you. Uh huh. Teaching tolerance and, 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 and stuff for your various subjects, right? So it's not just, you know, history and civics and social, you know, social studies. It's, um, you know, how to teach, talk about issues of today, immigration and, and the like, presidential election, you know, I mean, all these issues, they, they produce wonderful material on that, so. Thank you. Yeah, hey, no problem. All right, well, look, my kids have been really quiet, which has me nervous. So I'm gonna go upstairs <laughs> and see what they're up to. So thanks a lot for the extra time uh, and for your questions, Nicole and, and Rachel. And good luck, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeffries. Okay, for sure. Take care, y'all. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.